Okay, so a new chapter today, uh, chapter five, uh, the working cell. So last chapter we talked about how um, the structure of cells, the type of cells, and now we talk about how cells uh, work. Uh, and part of this is gonna be enzymes. And in fact, the uh, next uh, lab, on-campus lab will be uh, enzymes. And so a big part of this chapter is enzymes. Okay, so you can think of a cell as a machine that continuously and efficiently performs a very a variety of functions, movement, energy processing, production of various products. Cells control their chemical environment using energy. And so we're gonna talk about energy, basic um, uh, um, issues or uh, characteristics of energy and enzymes. And we're gonna talk about the plasma membrane and get into cell transport. Cell-based nanotechnology would be used to power microscopic robots. Well, I can talk about that. Cellular structures. Okay. Okay, the book uh, defines energy as the capacity to cause change. I was under the impression it was a different, um, uh, I had a different uh, definition for it. And it's similar to this one. Uh, I. Uh, my definition of those, the ability to do work with energy. So either capacity to cause change, ability to do work. Right. And some forms of energy are used to perform work, such as moving an object against an opposing force. And as we mentioned, or as I mentioned, um, you have to work to stay alive. Every living thing has to work constantly to stay alive. And we'll be, in this chapter, we're gonna look at what does that mean? What, what is biological work? Okay, energy can come in various forms. Um, one talks about whether it's energy of motion uh, or stored energy. So kinetic energy is the energy of motion uh, and potential energy is stored energy, energy that an object has because of its location or structure. So life depends on countless similar conversions of energy from one form to, to another. So we're gonna convert, um, so we're gonna get the chemical energy, it's chemical energy in my arm uh, in the form of glycogen. Uh, and I can convert that uh, first, that glycogen to glucose. And the glucose can be converted to, a uh, the energy can be stripped from glucose to make a molecule called ATP that allows me to convert that chemical energy into kinetic energy of moving my arm. Can an object at rest have energy? Well, yeah, as you just mentioned, chemical energy is potential energy. Potential energy is energy at rest. So my arm is at rest. There's energy in there, stored energy, um, and I can convert it to kinetic. So yeah, object at rest have energy. Okay, you turn the crank of a well, raising a bucket of water from below surface, uh, ground to the surface. What major theme is illustrated by its action? Pathways that transform energy and matter. Because I'm converting, as I said, moving my arm, converting chemical potential energy into muscular kinetic energy. So the energy transformation is to a dock. Uh, least potential energy, uh, down in the water. Uh, you have to convert kinetic, uh, uh, kinetic energy to potential energy by, by uh, climbing up the ladder. Now, this is a little, could be a little confusing. Now, sh uh, she's climbing up the ladder and she's actually converting chemical energy into uh, kinetic energy. But what she's gonna do is get up on top of the diving board. And now she has potential energy, not of, not, uh, of structure, but it's of position because he's higher up. And then, uh, um, and, and it's just like a, at a waterfall and you have a turbine on a waterfall, the water's up here. It falls, it has great uh, uh, gravitational potential energy and it can fall down a waterfall. And if you stick a turbine there, it'll turn the blades of the waterfall, uh, turn, turn the blades of the turbine and generate electricity. 
as it releases that, uh, that potential energy into kinetic energy of going down the waterfall and turning the blades. So diving converts potential energy to kinetic energy. And then uh, less potential energy, and then you can keep on going that uh, run. Remember that energy never leaves, it's just transformed. And that, that's true. We're gonna look at a law of nature later on saying that, and I've mentioned this before, you cannot make or destroy energy. You just use it, you transform it, you use it to do work and it leaves the seat. Well, there it is, that's the next slide. Conservation of energy, not possible to destroy great energy. You can just convert it from one form to the other and use it to do work. Heat is a type of kinetic energy contained in a random motion of atoms and molecules. Remember, molecules are always moving. Um, and just because of the thermal energy of the molecules, so, and there's more thermal energy, the faster and more violently they move. All energy conversions generate some heat. Uh, this is that if you uh, transfer energy from one molecule to, to another molecule, you can't transfer 100% of that energy. You're gonna lose a little bit as heat. And when I say lose, I mean heat is the, uh, or you can talk about the quality of energy. Uh, what do you mean quality of energy? Well, can you use this energy to do work? That's quality energy. Can you not use this energy to do work? That's low quality energy. And for living systems, for living things on earth, Heat is really low quality energy. That you can't use heat to do work. All right. And uh, so when you convert energy, this molecule to another molecule, you have less energy in the, in the, in the molecule that received the energy because some will have been lost as heat, right? Now, the, the idea of entropy, the measure of disorder or randomness in a system. Um, so if you've ever been in my uh, office, you noticed that uh, my desk ha has a uh, high entropy. It's, a pr it's pretty messy. Um, and uh, how about the energy of living things? Is, 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 a living thing, is a living thing of high uh, entropy or low entropy? Incredibly low energy because it's really highly, highly ordered, really complex and highly ordered. So we have really low entropy. And every time energy is converted from one form to the other, or from one molecule to the other, entropy increases. Because the more heat is generated, uh, uh, as far as energy goes, uh, you can think of heat as having really high entropy. It's, um, um, it's I guess it's really low quality energy. So, um, and what happens uh, is that entropy in the universe has to increase. Energy, uh, entropy always increases in the universe. Things are getting more disordered as we, as we go on. Um, so a lot of creations are saying, well, how can we have these incredibly ordered things, ordered things here in the universe? On, on Earth, these living things are incredibly ordered. How can we have them if in the universe, uh, if in the universe as a whole, entropy has to well, we maintain our really low entropy by the intake of really high quality energy from the sun originally is made into sugar and then we can use that uh, that to use ATP to maintain our low energy at the expense of the universe. Uh, so we, we have a constant supply of high quality energy from the sun. And so we can use that um, and then uh, all the energy that, that come into our body leaves this heat, and that heat goes into the, into the atmosphere, into space, and is lost forever. And eventually, all the stars will use up all of their hydrogen, and, it, and all that high quality energy will be converted to heat, and that's called the heat death of the universe. It's gonna happen, everything has gotta start, everything's gotta end. Of course, it's billions and billions of years in the future. Um, okay, so entropy is always increasing in the universe, that is. 
Okay, molecules of food, gasoline, other fuels have a form of potential energy called chemical energy. As I mentioned, uh, we have uh, chemical energy, uh, which arises from the arrangement of atoms and, and can be released by a chemical reaction. Uh, living cells and automobile engines use the same basic process to make the chemical energy stored in their fuels available for it. It's the same thing. It's called oxidation. Oxidation is the, is the loss of electrons. Uh, uh, and with that, there's always a gain of electrons. So if one molecule loses an electron, and it's so, it says it's oxidized, then another molecule gains an electron, and that electron is and that's called reduction. Electrons don't exist out there in, uh, alone by themselves like photons do. They're always associated with atoms in molecules. So, um, um, so uh, you essentially burn your food. Bur burning is a form of oxidation, stripping off electrons. So we burn our food. Uh, and uh, a, a, a car burns gasoline. It's the same basic chemical process, just that in the car it's done explosively, little explosions to push the pistons down. In living things, it happens in slowly controlled steps. We burn stuff, right? Okay. Which form of energy is most randomized and difficult to put to work? I already mentioned it. Heat. Um, now, human, uh, there's some human machines that can use heat to uh, do work, like a steam engine. But uh, heat is, it cannot be used by living things to do work. It's like waste energy. So it uses energy transformations in a car and a cell. Fuel rich in chemical energy, octane and oxygen. So gasoline and oxygen. Uh, glucose from food and oxygen. Uh, combustion is burning. And the, uh, the gasoline is, is burned in the, uh, in the uh, uh, car engine. Um, this uh, gasoline is put in the cylinder, the spark goes off. The, the gasoline uh, explodes really and pushes a piston down. And that it, uh, is converted to the transaxial and the differential and it moves the wheels. Um, and a lot of heat energy is, is, comes off. Um, your, car, your car engine gets really hot. That's why it has to have a cooling system. Um, and your car is only about 25% like efficient or so, a car, a automobile engines. That means about 75% uh, uh, of the engine of the, uh, the inherent chemical energy in the gasoline is lost as heat by making the engine hot. Okay, uh, and eventually, even the energy that's used to do work leaves as heat because of the friction of the tires on the road makes the tires hot and the road hot. And so that energy that was used to move the wheels actually converted to, to that heat. So all the energy eventually is converted to uh, to heat after it's used to do work. And then what comes out of your exhaust pipe? Carbon dioxide and water, waste products of combustion, right? Look at this from glucose from food. Heat energy, cellular respiration is uh, the burning process uh, where we extract the energy from food to make ATP. There's the ATP right down here. And that's used to do cellular work. A lot of heat energy comes off as well. Your body gets warm, right? but we're much more, we're more efficient in the car engine. We're about 34, 36% efficient. So a little more than 60% of the food, of the chemical energy in the food that you eat just comes off to provide heat that makes your body warm. Um, the other, uh, the rest is, is, is converted to ATP, and the ATP is, does work, the chemical, the uh, biologic work, which we'll get to what that is. And, um, but eventually that energy also leaves your body as heat. All the energy that comes into your body eventually leaves as heat. And then you gotta bring more energy in. 
And what are the waste products uh, of cellular respiration? The same thing as the car, carbon dioxide, water. Okay, so cellular respiration, the energy releasing chemical breaks out of fuel molecules and the storage of that energy in a form itself can use to do, to perform work. Uh, here, 34%, I said 34 to 36, it's actually a, a range, 34 to 36. Uh, about 34% of our food energy to use for work. The rest of the energy released by the breakdown of fuel mo molecules generates body heat. So keeping yourself warm is not really work. It's just like a waste product of the process to, uh, to make molecules that can be used to do work. But then remember, the ATP that's made, it, it, it is broken down to allow us to do work, but that becomes heat also, remember. Okay, calorie, you've heard of this term, calorie, is the amount of energy that can be raised the temperature of one gram of water by one degree uh, Celsius. So it's really a measure of heat. It's a measure of heat. Um, and uh, food calories uh, are kilocalories. That is, that, that calorie um, uh, is a, uh, is, it's really a small unit. So if we have to talk about, for example, the number of calories you need every day uh, to, to keep yourself alive, uh, it's gonna be a really big number. So uh, what we do is uh, turn calories into what's called kilocalories. A kilocalorie is a thousand calories, right? And on food uh, labels, they sometimes use kilocalories, but sometimes you just use calorie. And what they mean is kilocalories. So if you see a food label calories with a big C, that's a kilocal. Right. And um, the energy of calories in food is used to fuel the activities of life. So you need a certain number of calories every day to keep yourself alive. All right. Um, and uh, um, and we'll look at a little bit about how many cal ah, here we have calories. Here's calories consumed per item. So we have uh, uh, some uh, fruits, um, some cakes, a pizza, a hamburger, a taco. Uh, up, uh, th those all have a certain number of calories. And how do they figure out how much a calorie a, a cheeseburger is? Uh, or, or if you get buy something in, in a grocery store and it has this. This food, uh, you know, one serving size of this food is uh, equals this many calories. Well, they take that piece of food and they burn it to ash. They completely disintegrate it by burning it. And then what they do is they, they take uh, the, the heat that came off of that burning and subtracted the heat they had to add to burning. And that's how many calories it's built. Right? Uh, and then down below is the calories burned in doing certain things, just reading, right, a bicycle swimming, a tennis running, or a jump rope roping. These are how many calories uh, in 30 minutes that you burn by doing these, uh, these, uh, these activities. Remember, when you exercise, you get hot, hotter than normal because you're burning more calories. So chemical energy released by the breakdown of organic molecules, our food molecules, during cellular respiration is used to generate molecules of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, acts like an energy shuttle, stores energy obtained from food, and releases it later if needed. Well, that stored energy uh, obtained from food, that's kind of a misnomer. You don't have stored ATP. You, you don't store ATP. It's way too unstable molecule. All right, uh, you use it um, right away. As soon as you make it, you pretty much use it right away before it breaks down. So, um, so that's a little that's a little misleading. There, you really don't store energy as ATP. Uh, you uh, you uh, release it and you break it down to uh, to do work. And there's the ATP power. So there's the ATP. There's in triphosphate. Now those bonds between those yellow phosphate groups, they're really high energy, particularly the last one. 
And so what happens is ATP is broken down to ADP, there's a diphosphate plus one phosphate and energy is released. And that energy can be used to do work. So ATP, ATP breaks down the ADP and P out, it's called P sub I, the phosphate group, and that releases energy. So ATP energizes other molecules of cells by transferring phosphate groups to the other molecules. This energy helps cells maintain shape, enables the transport of ions and other dissolved substances to go up the membrane. Um, drives the production of, cell, of a cell's large molecules. So we're getting into work now. What is the meaning of biologic work? And there it is. There's biologic work. Uh, muscle contraction, motor protein performing mechanical work, moving a muscle part. This is work. And you have to contract muscles to stay alive. I don't have to contract this muscle to stay alive. I don't contract these muscles to stay alive. But I do have to contract this muscle. Heart muscle has to be contracting 72 times a minute or around in order to stay alive. This muscle down here, your diaphragm has to contract 12 times a minute uh, to, bring, to bring oxygen to your lungs. And, 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 uh, so that those muscles are absolutely necessary for life. You have to contract muscles to stay alive. Secondly, transport, active transport. We're going to get into diffusion in this chapter. I talk about cell transport, what's called passive cell transport, where things just go across membranes just because of the thermal energy. And, it, and, it, and energy, um, cellular energy is in need. That is, if you go from an area of high concentration to low, you don't need cellular energy to do that. That happens all by itself. That's called passive transport. But if you want to take um, molecules or ions or whatever into low concentration, and you want to put it into an area that already has a high concentration of those molecules or ions, you have to do what, use what's called active transport, and this is ATP. And this is required for life because uh, your nervous system works by letting ions cross the membrane by diffusion. And if you let that happen often, enough, those concentration gradients will disintegrate and your nervous system will not work. And if it doesn't work, you don't work. So you have to have active transport to counteract the leakage. And there's also leakage in nerve cells. Um, ions leak across the membrane. If you let that leakage go on long enough, you won't have concentration gradients and you won't be able to, uh, and things won't cross the membrane. Uh, along concentration gradients. So you have to have active transport to counteract that. Then making big molecules from small molecules. That requires energy. Uh, you know, a big complicated molecule from smaller, less complicated molecules. That's lowering entropy. That takes um, uh, ATP and also making cells. Uh, and that involves making big molecules. So that that is, uh, so that's chemical work. So muscular contraction, active transport, and uh, uh, synthesis of large molecules. That's pretty much the, all the forms of cellular work, and they all require ATP. Okay. Cells spend ATP continuously. Cellular work spends ATP, which is recycled when ADP and phosphate are recombined using energy released by cellular respiration. Up to 10 million ATPs are consumed in, in recycle each second in a working muscle cell. So this is the ATP cycle. I think it's the next slide. Cellular respiration, chemical energy harvested from fuel molecules will push ADP and P together to form ATP. Then ATP breaks down the ADP and PI, and that energy is used for cellular work. So uh, you have to convert the energy in your food molecules to the energy of ATP in order to do work to keep yourself alive. So metabolism is a total of all chemical reactions in an organism. And remember, that's one of the basic characteristics of life. All living things have a metabolism. 
And most beta alkyl reactions require the assistance of enzymes, proteins that speed up chemical reactions without being consumed by the reaction. Here, here's the thing. Um, and we'll be talk more about this in the enzyme lab. Um, a lot of chem chem the chemical reactions that go inside your cells will go, uh, go spontaneously. They, they, they go all by themselves. But they don't do that fast enough. Remember, life is a fast-paced thing. We talked about in the uh, in the uh, um, properties of water lab that cells are small because to, to make sure that diffusion is fast. Well, reactions have to be fast also, and they just go too slowly to maintain life. So you have to have something to speed them up, and that's what an enzyme does. It speeds up chemical reactions without being used up in the process. So all of it things contain thousands of different enzymes, each promoting a different chemical reaction. Enzymes are usually very specific. They catalyze one reaction and that's it. Sometimes, it's a, sometimes they catalyze a few similar reactions, but a lot of times it's just one reaction. So you need an enzyme. Uh, so you, you have thousands of reactions going on in your cells every second. So you need thousands of enzymes to make sure that those reactions are rapid. Okay, enzymes unravel and stop functioning if the environment gets too hot. What major theme is illustrated by this action? The relationship of structure to function. We're gonna find out, and we talked about this already, we talked about proteins, that almost all enzymes are proteins, and they work by having a particular shape, three-dimensional shape, because they have to attach to other molecules uh, that have a complementary shape. So you start screwing around with the shape, these proteins are not going to work as well. And temperature is something that will affect the functioning of enzymes. We're going to see that in lab. We're going to test the effect of, of temperature on enzyme uh, activity. Okay, activation energy is the energy that must be used to invest to start a reaction. Here's the thing, even explosive reactions require a little spark to get them going. And then, they, and then they go. And that's called the activation. And it's really important that this exists uh, in an oxygen atmosphere. Uh, I'll explain that in, in the enzyme lab because everything in this room is combustible. Why isn't it burst into flame? The activation energy is too high. But I can light a match uh, to something and I can burn, I can burn the whole room down if I, don't want to, if I, if I uh, reach that activation energy. By activating reactants and triggering the chemical reactions, enzymes enable metabolism to occur by reducing the amount of activation energy needed to break the bonds of reactant molecules. So it, it lowers, so you need a certain spark to get a reaction going. It's this high. Well, with an enzyme, it's this high. Much less, and these molecules can get over the hump and the reaction can continue. You can see here in, uh, in uh, that, uh, okay, a reactant um, uh, is something that's being acted upon by an, en an enzyme. It's also called a substrate. Uh, every every uh, molecule has got energy in it. And that's energy, so energy is on the, on the y-axis, how much energy. And some, some uh, you know, like a sugar molecule has got a lot of energy. Uh, water molecule or carbon dioxide molecule, very low energy. So you have this, this energy barrier here. In order, in order to break this bond into, the, these, into these two smaller molecules, you have to get over this hump. You gotta supply that, that amount of energy. If you have an enzyme, as I mentioned, the, the, the activation energy is reduced and the, the reaction happens much faster. Okay, so genetic sequences, I'm just gonna go to briefly go through this. Genetic sequences suggest that many of our genes were formed through a type of molecular evolution. Okay, so researchers randomly mutated many copies of a gene. And what they did was they irradiated with radiation. Radiation causes mutations. Remember, mutation is an error in copying a gene. So, so they caused actually more mutations than normal. Uh, and then they tested 
whether these enzymes are working better or worse. Most of the times, the, uh, when we get into genetics and mutations, find out most mutations are neutral. They don't do anything. Second most common, they screw things up. Very rarely, they actually make things better. Right? So they're looking for uh, a mutation that will make an enzyme work better. So after many rounds of directed evolution, this is called, results is also the gene that codes for an enzyme that's 100 times, 170 times more efficient at promoting the reaction than the original enzyme. So they actually came up with a beneficial mutation and uh, they can select it. Now this happens in, in nature too, that somehow some random mutation actually makes a, an enzyme works a little better and that gives that organism a little more advantage to, uh, to live longer and make more babies to pass on that change. That's a beneficial uh, mutation. The gene for enzyme duplicate, uh, duplicate and mutated random mutated genes uh, testing on the enzyme, uh, uh, genes showing uh, genes coded for enzymes that show improved activity, genes coded for enzymes that do not show improved activity, those are going to be the most of them, and genes duplicated and mutated at random, tested on new enzymes, and for many rounds, research isolated a gene that codes for a much more efficient enzyme. And sometimes also new enzymes. Sometimes mutations can lead to new enzymes, uh, which we can talk about later on when we get into that, uh, when we talk about plastic eating bacteria. They have evolved in the past um, 60, 70, 80 years. Plastic eating bacteria have evolved because they evolved a new enzyme that can eat, that can break down plastic. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get uh, on this enzyme activity and talk more about enzymes in the next uh, lecture. So this one's going to be a 103 working cell one. So I'll see you, I'll see you later. Catch you on the next uh, the next uh, video lecture. See you later.